excited about the word that I have to share. I like this time of year. Christmas is probably my favorite time of year. Not just because the song tells me that it's the most wonderful time of the year. There's a lot of songs that say about how wonderful it is. I have fond memories of my Christmas when I was young. Uh, of course, a lot of that had to do with gifts and presents. Uh, my father had a big family, many brothers and sisters that worked out well for me because they all gave gifts to the young children. And so I used to love to go to my father's side of the family. Uh, my, my normal Christmas day was spent waking early. Of course, very excited about the gifts under the tree in my house. And I would, you know, my mother and father, uh, when I was very small, they, they pretended and did everything so that it would be perfect. Well, I won't use that word depending on who's in the room. Santa came and left the gifts. And so we would wake up very excited and can immediately go and see the presents there and open them. And then after that, we would have a light breakfast because Christmas Day, there was so much eating to do at the family's houses. And so then we would take off and drive to first my mother's side of the family. And they were, they were also a big family, many brothers and sisters working out really well for me. Then all of these gifts would be given. And we had a, a, a big vehicle. And by the end of the day, there was no room left in the vehicle to fit all of the gifts. So uh, how many of you know that as a child, that's a very happy day. It was the happiest day. And I really enjoyed it. But some 32, 33 years ago, quite a while back, the, the most wonderful gift I ever received was the revelation of Jesus and what he did for me. In fact, it was at this very time of year, I don't know exactly the day that I gave my heart to Christ, but it was right before Christmas. So it was about these weeks, this month for sure, uh, when I received Jesus as my Savior. And I remember because we were going to a family gathering and I had already told my mother quite a bit about my relationship with Jesus and I was speaking to her. And at that time she was a little worn out because all I spoke about was Jesus. Jesus this, Jesus that. Because when you get saved, of course, your whole life becomes Jesus. And I would tell her. And she was actually quite irritated with me. And she said, that's enough Jesus already. And so sometimes your family members will do that. And, you know, we need not get angry with them. We understand. Because really the gift of the revelation of what Jesus is and who Jesus is, it comes from the Father. Flesh and blood does not reveal it to us. Now, we do our best to convey the message of Christ to our family members simply because we love them and we want them to have the same gift that we've received. But the fact is, we can't. We can't change their hearts. We can't. It has to be something from the Father that comes to them. So really, my prayer at Christmas time for our families and for everyone is that the Father would give that gift to them, the gift of the revelation of who Jesus is. And that's my prayer for your families and certainly my prayer for all of your loved ones, my loved ones, and a lot of my family do know Jesus, but not all do. And uh, I'm praying. Even my own father, he does not yet know Christ from, unless something's changed in the last uh, weeks. But I'm praying for him. So I invite your prayers for my family this time of year, and, and I will pray for your family. Amen? Amen? So we pray in intercession for each other's families because everyone needs an encounter with the Lord. And I want to, before we get into the message, we're going to pray to bless the offering. And the way we're going to do it is just pass the basket around so we can go right into the Word. So if you don't mind, let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity to give. We know that you love a cheerful giver. We give with cheer. If it's not cheerful, then we shouldn't even give. We want to do what your Spirit tells us to do. So those who give tonight in the offering, bless them. Multiply it back to them. Let everyone do what they feel in their heart to do because you are the provider. You're the one that pays for everything and takes care of everything. And here we have this opportunity to contribute to your kingdom. So we count it a great honor to sow seeds into your work, Lord. So bless this offering we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And that way, as they, as they pass that around, if you're here visiting with us, there's absolutely no pressure. Just let the pastor just hand it to the person next to you. Uh, the title of this message tonight is The Shepherds, An Encounter with God. And I want to start by saying that people all over the world this time of year, of course, were celebrating Jesus as a baby. The images that Christmas engenders of Christ is a small baby, like the precious little Cebola baby that's here tonight. <laughs> so sweet. 
that I look at the baby all the time on, on Facebook. But that, like a little baby, we picture Jesus. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. But people all over the world are celebrating this. We celebrate the fact that our Heavenly Father has sent this gift, like I said, this treasure to us. And the birth of Jesus was the beginning of the salvation of man. And that's exactly what the angels say. That's what the prophecies said about the coming of Christ. And we're going to study that, being that it's this time. I love the passages. If you were not here last week, you missed the message about the birth of your ministry. Really good message. It is available. You could go on YouTube or the Antioch website and follow the links. And it speaks about the analogy of the birth of Jesus through Mary as the birth of our destiny, our ministries, or our purpose. And that just as Jesus existed in heaven before He came to earth, He was the Word before. It says in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The Word was God. And after He came down and the Word became a physical human being, in other words, the Father, His own Son, Jesus, and we saw Him. He became real. And Mary was the one through whom this baby was born. As a virgin, she conceived. And the amazing thing was that she was used of God to bring something that was in eternity into existence on earth so that all men could be saved. That everyone would be blessed. So what we talked about last week was that our ministries, our, our dreams, or let's say the plan of God for our life, our destiny exists in heaven before the earth is ever made. It says that things He's planned for you or the purposes were predestined before the foundation of the earth. And those things are in heaven as a plan for Him, but they are born through us through the birth of our destinies. And we don't want to miss the opportunity. And last week's message was about that. How can we be sure not to miss that opportunity or miss the destiny that God has for us? So I encourage you to... Check out that message if you can. But tonight we're going to continue with the shepherds in an encounter with God. Let's begin by reading a passage we also read last week in Luke chapter 2, verse 1. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census to taken or that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available for them. This creates the image of what we call the nativity scene, the barn with the manger and the animals and the little baby laid in this feeding trough, the manger, because there was no room for them. A lot of people think, well, they were so poor they couldn't afford a hotel. That's not the case. It was booked up because of this census, because there were so many people coming in the register within a certain amount of time, they did not have the ability to make reservations online or whatever. And so when they got there, there was no other place to stay. And I, I find it fascinating that the creator of the universe was not able to find a place to stay. And interestingly, when Jesus was honored, the disciples asked where he was staying. And he said, I'll show you, but I don't have any place. He said, the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Because Jesus was not tied to this world. And he proved it from his birth. It was not important enough for him to be born in a palace on a marble slab with golden angels surrounding him. But he chose such an obscure place. And it says a lot about the character of Christ and the focus of God. God's focus is not on the things of this world. Now, God's focus is not on the gifts that we give to each other. And for many people, and myself included, I never knew what Christmas was gift giving. That's all it was to me. Until I was 17 and, and the Lord revealed to me the truth about Jesus. But everyone surrounding Jesus when he was born were impacted by the event. In fact, it, so impacting was the event of Jesus being born that time as we pounded today changed. 
that before Christ, we count backwards. Jesus is born, and the world started the calendar over again. So if you're going to speak about a political impact of a man being born on earth, I don't think we have an equal to it. That Jesus changed the way that we see time. As he came down out of eternity, intersecting time, it's interest that, interesting that time from his birth goes in two different directions. That he's the center of time. He's the center of all things. And we know that's true of him as the creator. But we see that the people around him were affected. In fact, there are a lot of people that were. We know that, for instance, Zechariah and Elizabeth, before Jesus was ever born, these are the parents of John the Baptist. They were affected. They were aged, not able to have children, but an angel came to Zechariah while he was serving his priest and told him that his wife would become pregnant and that, sh that he should name the child John and that John would be John the Baptist. In other words, preceding the birth of Jesus, preceding the life and ministry of Jesus, God arranged for this couple to receive a miracle so a man could stand and testify as a voice crying out in the wilderness that one is coming who is so wonderful and so great. But we see also that, of course, Mary and Joseph, as we covered about the birth of the ministry last week, we see that Mary and Joseph were greatly inconvenienced if you would, by the birth of Jesus and the way that Jesus was born, all the circumstances, the impact of it, that it happened at an inopportune time. It happened in an inopportune uh, manner, an unorthodox way that this child was born. We see the astrologers, or some people call them the Magi or the wise men, that their world was based on astrology, observation of the stars and the planets and their position relative to the earth, and the stars told them the way that the world appeared to them, their science proved to them that the Messiah would be born. And a particular star was the mark of where they could find Jesus. Some, some say that it was probably a comet. In fact, mathematically or according to astronomy, there is a comet that passed at that very time within that could have been a comet. But whatever the case, their world was transformed and they were also motivated to bring money to the family of Jesus to finance the early life of Christ. They're the ones that brought the gold, the incense, the myrrh, these precious uh, um, fragrant stones or the sap that come from trees. It was very valuable. Uh, some estimate that there was enough money produced to support Jesus for a very long time from those gifts. So the father was providing for his son. And these astrologers, they were used to do it. Then we see the shepherds. The shepherds in the wilderness and suddenly revealed to them is the fact that Jesus will be born. And we see the shepherds actually going to the nativity as we call it. Now, I will have to correct something about a lot of nativity scenes. They show the nativity scene with Jesus in the manger and there's the wise men and the shepherds together. They, did not, they never met each other. Because those were, they were totally separate from one another. The, by the time the astrologers came to see Jesus, he was no longer in a manger. And by the way, they didn't keep him in a manger for months on end to prove a point. As soon as there was a room available, they were in the room. And at the point that the astrologers came, which was after the experience of the shepherds, they already had the money um, to be well taken care of, and they were. Of course, but then we lose sight of Jesus after that for quite some time until he's 13. But our subject tonight, we also know that the king was affected. The king was affected in an adverse way because it threatened his kingship, threatened his kingdom because the prophecy said that born was the king of Israel. And this guy was thinking, wait a minute, I'm the king of Israel. And I'm not going to let anyone displace me. So actually, he put out an edict to murder the children. And so we know from the beginning, Satan wanted to destroy Jesus. All of this, the whole world was turned upside down by the birth of this one baby. And that's what we think about when Christmas comes. All the inhabitants of the earth were affected. But in this teaching, I want us to examine how the birth of Jesus affected these shepherds. We're going to see four things we have in common with the shepherds. The way that the shepherds interacted surrounding the birth of Jesus, we're going to see some things in their life that are the same things that we go through and how the birth of Jesus affects you and affects me. Because it does affect us. But I also want you to consider it this way. And in my meditation this morning, 
I begin to think about Jesus as a little baby and how Jesus grows. And I start to think about my spiritual life, being that this is my spiritual birthday, 32, 33 years ago, and uh, I'm not even sure. I think it's 33. I don't, I don't even know my own age half the time. But anyway, three decades ago, that's more general, easier to say. Three decades ago, at this time, I had this experience, and I've been growing ever since. And when we first received Jesus, we're like that little tiny baby Jesus. And uh, we don't understand a lot. If you were to go to Jesus as a baby, first of all, understand that he was completely natural. He was not uh, levitating above his bed, glowing, and when you walk near him, the glory would touch. No, he was a normal. There were, there's no writing in the Bible. How many of you have ever seen all the pictures of the halo? Uh, there's no halo in the Bible. There's no description of it. It's just kind of a, a romantic notion of artists that they put this halo on people and so we kind of believe and think that they had halos. No. He was special, no doubt. But he was just a baby. So it is in the beginning when we first know Jesus, we, in our infancy in Christ, are like little babies. There's not a lot we know. And it takes quite some time. You know that I always compare here the chronological development of a spiritual being just like that of a natural being. That when you are one year old in Christ, you are just learning to spiritually walk. And you're still stumbling. When you're two years old in Christ, you're just starting to really speak phrases spiritually. Three years old, four years old, five years old, you're just starting to become uh, someone that can hold conversations in a spiritual context. But we need to give ourselves time to spiritually develop. There are people that believe that they're amazing because I've been knowing Jesus for 15 years. Well, how many amazing 15-year-old people do you know? I mean, really amazing. I know a few. But when someone is 15, they're still a teenager. They're still an adolescent. And sometimes they're missing some of the fullness of life. How many of you would agree? The same in Christ. So how many 20-year-olds do you know that are still, they don't have it all figured out yet? There's still a lot of play in them. They're having fun. There's nothing wrong with that. Enjoy your youth. Enjoy it. But the fact is, in spiritual development, it's not too different from that. When we grow, we learn. And so we're going to see here these shepherds and four things that we have in common. I'm going to start with number one. The shepherds were ordinary people chosen for an extraordinary task. They were not special. I always ask, why didn't God reveal this to the Pharisees? or the religious leaders? Why didn't he reveal it openly to uh, important people, priests or politicians? He chose this obscure group of people, shepherds, out in the middle of nowhere. He chose to reveal it to them. Luke 2, 8 says, And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. So they were simply working shepherds. I don't believe they had any expectations that night of having the experience that they're about to have. They're just minding their own business, like we all do sometimes. We live our lives. Uh, we make our plans. If you're shepherds, you shepherd your sheep. If you are a cook, you cook food. If you are whatever you are, you do what you do. The shepherds were shepherding. That's all they knew to do. And they weren't really interested in anything other than fulfilling what their life had put them in. In other words, the path they were on. But something extraordinary is about to happen to them. And I believe it's the same with us. A lot of us, before we know Jesus, before we know about Jesus, before we know that Jesus is real, which they're about to find out for the first time. You understand, it was not written in the newspaper, soon the Christ will be born. There was no foreknowledge of what was taking place. There were only obscure prophetic passages that generalized what could possibly happen. That's why he had to speak to individuals to make it right and reveal to them so that they can tell others. And that's why I'm so amazed that he chose shepherds. And I'm so grateful because he chooses the ordinary people. I will say that I am an ordinary person. I've always been an ordinary person. In fact, less than ordinary. Uh, everybody was better than me. 
Everybody was wealthier than me. Everybody had a higher education than I did. Everyone did better in school. Everyone was faster than I was. I was a little strong, so at least I had that. I could because I was always big bodied and I could pick up things and move them, but everybody was better at all things. But God chose me and chose to reveal to me when I was only 17 years old just this. And at that time when he found me, I was doing nothing but being me. And no plans, no ideas, and the Lord began to work in my life. And I think a lot of you probably have that similar experience. That when you first meet Christ, you're not expecting it. You're just living your life. Maybe if you were Christian orientation, it does not mean you know Jesus just because you are of a Christian descent. It's just you are associated with a religious code or a principle. To really know Him is different than, than nominally being associated with Him. And I think we all can agree to that. And many of us did not expect God to do what He's done for us. And God has often taken me by surprise suddenly come and do something wonderful. And the reason He does this is because God has a plan for us. God has a plan for these shepherds. At this point, they're ordinary, but He's chosen them to do an extraordinary task. And I'm telling you that every single person that yields to the revelation of who Jesus is, God wants to do something extraordinary through your life. Something amazing. Something beyond your ability. Something bigger than you and brighter than you and greater than you to bring glory to Him, but also to convey you to a whole other place in life so that you can be blessed, so that you can prosper, so that you can eternally know Him. Remember that God is never in the entertainment business. Now I want you to think about this as the shepherds are in the wilderness, they're about to have this encounter, but God's not coming to do a song and dance for them to wow them and then leave them. Because every time, and we're about to see the encounter, every time somebody in the Bible has an encounter, they are immediately given a job. There's no encounters that people have that are more like fireworks displays that, wow, boom, boom, you see the lights and then you go home. The encounters of God always are followed by directions and instruction. Remember, Moses was a shepherd. Moses was minding his own business, shepherding the sheep, just like these guys. But then there appeared to him the burning bush, which he went over to interact with. And what's the first thing after he revealed, God revealed to Moses that it was him? First thing he says, I need you to do a job for me. You're going to go and speak to my people. You're going to speak to Pharaoh. Tell them to let my people go. Of course, that task was bigger than Moses. And Moses tried to get out of it. Because the things that he's choosing for us to do are extraordinary. But the shepherds were ordinary people, just like you, just like me. I'm not criticizing you tonight, but I believe that we're all pretty much ordinary people. Some of us are far more handsome than others. Some of us are far more beautiful than others. But all in all, we're, we're pretty average people, because I don't think we would even be here right now if it weren't so. We would be in some other spectacular arena of life. But God brought us here tonight, like shepherds in the field, living our lives and doing what we're doing because He wants to reveal Himself to us. Number two, the shepherds had an encounter with God that changed them forever. And I think we have this in common. Luke 2, 9 says, An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. The angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom His favor rests. Here we see God's favor resting on a group of shepherds in the middle of nowhere, in the dark. And there's so many things we see, so many attributes to an encounter with God here. Number one, that He appears when He does so, it suddenly He overtakes us and we're always terrified. 
In the Bible, when people have encounters, they're so terrified, they fall as dead, the Bible says. How many have ever been scared to death? I mean, we throw that phrase around. But when God comes on you, you can be scared to death. We'll say, well, I don't want to be scared to death. Well, the Bible says that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And that we should have the kind of encounters that cause us to be afraid. If you want encounters that do not cause any fear in you at all, it's just okay, I just want to kind of religiously exist, then I doubt that God will be able to successfully interact with you. There's so much more. If we want to live the standard of the Word of God and see what happens in the Bible, God can really and truly interact with you in a powerful way that might terrify you, but that will also empower you and transform you from the inside out. And of course, they were terrified. The angel said, don't be afraid. I don't like how personal he makes it after saying, I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Yes, all the people, but today in the town of David, the Savior has been born to you. Personal Savior. It is your Savior. Not just the Savior of everyone, because everything in an encounter starts with us being saved by Jesus. That we have that encounter that changes us and renews us. He's the Messiah and the Lord. That revealed to us that He is the Christ. That's what the Father shows us. This will be a sign to you. He wants to show you signs and wonders to prove Himself. You'll find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. And then suddenly, if it were not enough that this one angel is blowing their minds. In the middle, imagine you have to picture where it was dark. They're out there, you know, walking with a stick and some sheep. Then suddenly, zoom, this angel comes and starts speaking to them. They're terrified. It says they're terrified. This is before God pulls back the curtain. But after he says it to them, he says, no, this is true. Let me show you something. He pulls back the curtains of all of heaven and they see this whole host of angels. How many of you would like to have an experience like that? Be careful what you ask for. It's Christmas. God can give you a gift. God manifested his power to them. Why? To convince them and shock them. This manifestation changed them forever. This is what he did to the Apostle Paul on the road to Damascus. Same thing. Why? Because God does this to redirect us. These guys might be shepherds right now, but they're not going to be shepherds much longer. The disciples, they may have been fishermen, but they weren't fishermen for very long. Encounters are about taking you as you are and making you something you're not. Greater, stronger in spirit. Bolder to be able to do amazing things. And remember, as I said, every time that He touches you, every time He does something, it's so that you can be one to speak. Remember when he, he told Saul of Tarsus, which is the Apostle Paul, you will be the one, the instrument, my chosen instrument, He called him to Ananias. But He said, you'll go speak to the Gentiles, to the non-Jewish people. You're going to bring the message about me. And He said in that vision, I'm Jesus. And you're going to go tell the people. This is what encounters do. Now this is important. Number three, the shepherds pursued God after having an encounter. And I'm going to tell you the significance of this after we read the passage. It says in verse 15, When the angels had left them and gone into heaven. And let me start with this. Encounters happen in a moment of time. But then that encounter in that moment ceases. It is a touch from God. A touch is simply a touch. If I came to you right now, touched you and walked away, you would no longer feel that touch. You may have some residual effects of it mentally, emotionally, spiritually even, if the anointing is moving, but that encounter comes and goes. All the people in the Bible, they did not remain in the company of a whole group of angels. Not for the rest of their lives where they're walking around, hallelujah, hallelujah. That would be really scary, nor would anybody ever want to listen to them because they're just a huge crowd of angels. Isaiah didn't stay in his heavenly experience. Ezekiel didn't stay stuck under the wheel within the wheel watching the fire for the rest of his life. Elisha didn't stay staring there at the fiery chariot doing loops in the sky for the rest of his life. No. All 
his experiences came and went as a simple moment of change to catapult people to become and to do something to send them. And that's exactly what God does to us. And that's what he's doing to these shepherds. So we have this in common. The shepherds said to one another, let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So the Lord revealed it to them and spoke it to them. They had the encounter that stated it, but had they seen Jesus yet? No. They had an encounter, but they have not yet intimately related with Jesus Christ. So the encounter was an eye-opener or an awakening to be able to motivate them to pursue God. Now, we don't know the details because it says, So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. Do you think that they rushed straight in out of the field in the obscure darkness of night and the first manger they come across was Jesus in the manger? Maybe supernaturally that happened. I don't think so. I think they went from barn to barn, opening doors, looking in mangers. Because it says that they heard off and found Mary and Joseph, which means they were seeking for Mary and Joseph. And encounters are not the sum total of the activity of God in your life. In fact, encounters are more about an invitation to you to seek Him with all of your heart. To seek first His kingdom and His righteousness. To never stop being hungry for God. To experience more. To know more. To go after the deep things of God. An encounter should simply be a stepping stone to the next encounter. And then the next one. And then the next one. Every single church service should be an encounter you have with the divine creator. That brings you to the next level. That's how we will incrementally grow. So now they go, they find, they pursue God's presence, the presence of Jesus, after their initial encounter. Now what is sad is I've seen a lot of people that have failed to do this. I know I could say many, more than a hundred, that I have seen have encounters with God in meetings just like this, in my ministry, around the world, places I've preached, Encounters supernatural that they said with their own mouth, I've never experienced anything like this is amazing. I'm going to start a new life. I'm going to live. But after that meeting, something happens and they seem to forget about the encounter and they begin to rationalize how it probably wasn't really a spiritual thing. I think maybe I imagined that. It was something in my mind. And it's so sad because they don't seek the whole purpose of the encounter, and that is to personally know Jesus. They sought Him. They found Him. Imagine if they'd been through five barns, six barns, ten barns, twenty barns. We don't know because the Bible says the one that seeks and keeps on seeking finds. What if on the 31st barn they swung that door open and there is a baby wrapped in cloths laying in a manger Yes, we found it. And I know it's just a baby. But what must it have been like to know what the angels told you? To know who that was. And to go and kneel at the side of that manger. I picture them saying to Joseph and the Mary, Excuse us, could we please touch the baby? Wouldn't you want to touch that baby? And I, I picture that moment when you could take that baby's hand. It's Jesus. It's the creator of the universe. Paradoxically, put into the form of a human being for us to take that little hand. What we would think because of what we know about that hand. That baby's hand that would one day have a nail driven through it for me. That baby's hand, that would one day, when that baby grew up, lay hands on sick people and they'd be healed. Touch dead people and raise them. Reach into coffins, raise the dead. The miraculous power in that little baby. No, I don't believe the little baby was a glowing orb of power and you could receive from it. But it was what he would become. 
I see that Jesus in young people everywhere. I see that baby Jesus in you. I see it in the ministries that surround me. And I know that you might not be there yet, but if you just stay the course, you will grow. You will become something so wonderful. Just stay faithful to Him. Just serve Him. When you have an encounter with God, be like these. Be, have in common with them what they did. They hurried off in fact. Don't have an encounter and think, well, I'm going to wait a while and see. Maybe God will come to me again. No. Seek Him till you find Him. Find Jesus personally. Interact with Jesus personally for your life. He's there waiting for you. We are the two or more that respond in the name of Jesus. I like the collectivity of them, what they do together. It says, let us go. They made a choice together. Two or more gathered in His name, and it says, whatever they agree upon will happen. They had to come to a decision together to seek Jesus. I think of it in a church. When we have a church service, we have a time of worship. We have to come into agreement. That's why I always say, come into agreement. We are, I say the same words again and again because we have to be in agreement to go find Jesus in this capacity. Just like they were. And they went and they found Him. We are the two or more. We, we, when we decide, anything is possible. When we decide to agree, anything can happen. What if one of the shepherds had said, uh, no, I don't think I'm going to go. I'm going to stay here in case the angels show up again. No, they were told what to do. And that's what I have found also. People haven't encountered, they're given instructions by God that are pretty specific and clear, but they don't walk out those instructions. They wait for God to confirm it or to say more. We need to be in a hurry when it comes to the things God tells us to do. Don't hesitate. Number four. Finally, the shepherds testified about Jesus. Verse 17, Luke chapter 2. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And this is interesting because formerly they were shepherds and now they're evangelists. And what they had witnessed, what they had experienced. Imagine how powerful their testimony was to the people to whom they spoke. Especially if you knew them. You knew this shepherd. You knew these shepherds. We, By the way, we don't have a number of how many shepherds. It could have been two. It could have been 20. There could have been a shepherd's convention out there for all of you. Whatever the case, there was more than one. And they agreed together to go on this mission to tell everyone. And they did it. Now, notice that they were not commanded to go and tell everyone. They were just told that this Messiah has come. They took it upon themselves to testify and tell everyone about their encounter with God. And I know that if you were somewhere and the shepherd walked in on you and you knew him, hey, how's the sheep? Forget the sheep, man. I need to tell you what happened. We were out in the wilderness with the sheep and then all of a sudden and they tell you the story. And the angel told us this, that, the other and then he said, go and find him. We went. We found, as a sign to us, we found him. And the people, of course, were amazed at that. We all need to do the same thing. This is what we have in common. After you have an encounter, you do what God calls you to do because he's, this is the job he gave them. Whatever job he gives you, make sure you do that job. We can testify of what we have experienced. The more real God is to us, the more real He will be through us, no matter what we have experienced, albeit a simple testimony, simple experiences. Maybe you cannot qualify your experiences in some dynamic way, but you can express what you feel about God. And that I might not have it all figured out, but I do know something touched me. Something moved on me. When you say that, as real as you remember it in that moment, it transmits from you, out of you, to the people you speak. And I'm sure when they spoke about that glory that shone on them as shepherds, people could feel it. Like, oh man, that gives me the goosebumps. That's incredible. 
Yes, He's born. The Messiah. I say let God touch you this Christmas. Let God give you an encounter so that you can bring encounters to other people. Maybe you are the encounter that people are waiting for. Last week we ended with that idea. Simeon was in the temple. When they brought Jesus in, he saw Him and he knew right away in the Spirit, he knew that was the Messiah. They didn't come in and say, oh look, we got the Messiah here. They just came in to do the ceremonial rites for a newborn baby as Jewish people. But Simeon knew who that baby was. And he's, thank you, Lord, that I can die in peace. That man waited his whole life for that to be born. So it is, I believe, people out there are waiting to have an encounter with God from your life, from your experiences, from your testimony from your words that you speak. You may be the encounter for other people. I say this from a perspective of absolute knowledge. I have been my ministry, my words, and they're simply my testimonies. I like the way that our friend in Uganda said it, my glory stories. <laughs> simply my glory stories have caused more people to be touched by God and understand God is bigger and subsequently they have an experience that changes them. They go out and tell other people and that experience is transmitted through them and those people have experiences and God becomes more and more real. He wants to prove Himself to you just so that He can prove Himself through you like He did with these shepherds. In fact, if you want a motivation to give to God as to why He should touch you, say to Him, I want you to touch me so that I can touch people. I want you to move on me with power so that I can convey that power to other people. With that in mind, I guarantee you will have the greatest encounters you can imagine. You know why I had encounters with God as a young Christian? Because I immediately knew that I was called to ministry. I immediately knew that I was going to go to the nations. First thing God ever told me is I was going to go to the nations preaching. And I thought, man, I don't want to go empty-handed. And I am not worth much. But if the Spirit of the Lord, silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have, I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise and walk. The ability to let God's Spirit flow through you. He wants to prove Himself to you so that He can prove Himself through you. These are the four things that we saw. We have these in common with the shepherds. Number one, the shepherds were ordinary people chosen for an extraordinary task. You, the shepherds had no idea, by the way, beforehand. Right now, some of you are on the verge of having an encounter with God and you have no idea what is about to be revealed to you. You have no idea in these coming days, in these coming hours, or even these coming minutes, what can be revealed to you by His Spirit. Number two, the shepherds had an encounter with God that changed them forever. I don't know about you, but I think we can all use some changing. How many of you would like God to change the things in your life you can't seem to change? We all have these issues, these things, and we can ask God. God can do changes on us that we cannot do on ourselves for His glory, for His purposes. And after we have this encounter, we need to make sure that we pursue God like the shepherds do. It never stops. People say, well, you seem to have a lot of encounters. It's because I do a lot of seeking. And I never stop. With intensity, I seek. Every song I sing, you may notice that I'm on the verge of screaming blood out of my mouth. In everything with power. Everything with force. I'm pressing in. I'm pressing in. Because I'm seeking the Lord. Finally, the shepherds testified about God. I stand as witness tonight. I testify to you about what Jesus is, about what Jesus has done for me. And I believe that God can touch you and give you power. Why don't we stand on our feet? The presence of the Lord is here. Jesus is in this place. Father, we thank you. 
as we look into your word, we know that it releases heaven's energy. But every phrase that has been recited from your holy word power has been pouring into this room. And I believe that the power of heaven is combustible. And that right now, we are standing in a pool of flammable liquid. And that all it takes is a spark. All it takes is faith. All it takes is a little hope. A hungry heart. A hungry heart. Right here in this place, Lord, we reach out to you. We say, move on us. Give us the kind of encounter that the shepherds. Let us feel your glory, your power in this place. We do this in the name of Jesus. Ha! The name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus.